power, even if they stop being corrupt, it's still going to be very difficult for us to be able to provide the kinds of services um, that we need for us to be able to move forward, which then means that our situation, our marginal situation in a global political economy, which is based on exploitation and also which is hierarchical and based on the wishes of, of course, the big powers, is also very important for us to pay very specific and, and, and important um, attention to. Now, coming back to the question of violence, I think power relations within Sierra Leone easily lends itself to violence and abuse. Now, we might not see this because we like to think of Sierra Leone as a peaceful country, but I'll give you some examples. In the university, a, a, if a student, for instance, refuses to sleep with a professor, they could be failed. A, in the university, you could be even failed if your friend um, let's say you are the love interest of a, party, a, a certain lady that a certain professor wants to sleep with. And so there is this abuse, um, and that was precisely what led to the, to, to the war. The expulsion of a bunch of students in 84, 85 was actually the moment in which um, some of them decided, that, oh, well, now let's go and, and start training. So in Sierra Leone, whether it is between the state and demonstrators, and that has not changed. Recently we saw minors who were protesting against conditions of service were shot by, 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 by state security officers. So there is a pattern of violence that is embedded in Sierra Leone society. This is not to say that we are necessarily a violent people, but that the state itself um, and its position, the way in which that state was created coming from um, the colonial imposition and the way in which power is exercised within that state, up to this day we have not been able to, to, to reform um, the way That's in the which um, the state relates with, with its citizens. And as a result, what you have is a situation where easily violence gets out of hand. So if you go between the chiefs and, and their wards, for instance, part of the reason why the RUF violence was so nasty was because it's not only because the RUF itself was committing, the RUF committed violence, but they were not the only ones. Certain exactly. families were telling their kids to join the warring factions. There was a tit for tat violence in the countryside in which people land um, issues dr Y. land issues that had laid down for years came in into the exactly, war right? and so that that was kind of embedded within the sierra leonean society and and so whether it is the professor whether it's the state um, um security officers or even on the street people will easily just start arguing before you know it they start fighting and so when yeah. the war um happened it provided the opportunity for some of those issues that lay dormant to come to the fore. That's why the violence was so nasty. And once the violence gets out of hand, it becomes difficult to control. But also, it is, yeah. we know that normally um, insurgency groups that are trying to overthrow or fight an authoritarian regime also end up mimicking the violence that they are fighting in the first place. That's precisely yeah. what happened with the RAF. So to end this, I think we need to look at the, 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 the social relations, the power relations within the state, how we react to each other. What does the state do, for instance, when people are just protesting for basic better condition of life? Do we bring the, the paramilitary to shoot them, or do we try and negotiate with them? And I think it's really looking at the nature of the state, the type of violence that is embedded within that. Um, I think it's also very important to the conversation that we are having as a way forward. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is the debate from Voices of, from the Diaspora Radio, and we have been unpacking the lessons of Sierra Leone's decade-long civil war. At this point, we shall take a break. Thank you. Sierra Leone Diaspora Radio Network. This program has been brought to you by 
by African Sports Monthly Magazine, a digital online sports magazine for Africa covering all sports disciplines across all of Africa, bringing you insights into the inner workings of sports across the continent. Check the latest edition out by visiting www.africansportsmonthly.com. Again, that is www.africansportsmonthly.com. Welcome again, viewers, to today's discussion on Sierra Leone's decade-long civil war, Unpacking the Lessons. Now we shall take a final rundown, and I will ask um, my panelists to, to summarize what they think the lessons are, and probably to state what, what is the recipe for a future stable Sierra Leone, starting with um, Ms. Claudia Anthony. Well, going back to lessons learned, I think I will just go back to the Mabanga Bridge that Jalo Jamboya mentioned. I was on that bridge on the 15th, that's a week ago, yesterday. Yesterday, the bridge collapsed. I entered the bridge, I stopped for a while, wanted to photograph because I was wondering what am I going to go through. It was dangerous, the driver said, and we drove on. I managed to take some photos of it. So the Mabang book is down now. But talking about lessons learned, I hope a lesson will be learned from this and the very bridge will not be allowed to collapse like the Mabang bridge did. <laughs> okay, that's just to come in. Well, um, I think that there are some gains that have been made because um, we see some improvement around. Even the blind people see it around. There is a lot of work on buried infrastructure, and we are seeing that the modern child medical facility, although not all mothers and children are getting it, and there are lots of um, corruption around it. We see the anti-corruption making strides to track them down and make them pay for, for being corrupt. But the thing is to be missing burden and saving lives in families. So I think those are things that we could say um, are, are, are positive. However, let us look at the Pujon district. There's a lot of large, large-scale deals going on there by foreign investors. They don't get the people who are traditional landowners involved in it have visited the area on more than one occasion, working on stories with the families, the people who are suffering from what is happening there. We are talking about food security. We don't know how secure food is in Sierra Leone. We see hundreds of tractors coming, on, coming in through the key being distributed across the country. But you go to the market, you buy rice from Vietnam, from Thailand, and other places in Asia. Where is the rice that we produce? What has been done in the past five years over on the beach? Um, food security. Food security also has to do with nutrition. We just got the, the 2013 report out from the Concern Worldwide and other institutions that came together to do that report. Nutrition is poor, only 71 out of 76 countries. So what are we talking about? Food security. Nutrition is part of it. Supposing we have floods, Supposing there's drought, where is the excess? Where, where are the stores? Where are the barns? Where we are keeping what we are producing? So these are things that we should also pay attention to and pay attention to the land deals there. And I will say go back to the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's um, recommendations and let's work there. Somebody also mentioned that we should set up an institution, a national institution, that will bring together people from across different thinking and help to push the country forward in a nationalistic way. I think I, I would agree to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Jalo Jambrea, your final thoughts? 
Um, like I've started, Mr. Chairman, I think we still need to do more to close the, the gaps we have in our society. Dr. Y and uh, Jalo did make clear certain features we still have in our society. But like I said, we need to have a more open and tolerant approach to governance. What I would add to what I had already said is that we must find a way to make our public administration, by which I mean the non-political side of our public administration, more committed to developing the nation than to the political party in power. We should more or less try to find a way to make our public administrators non-political in their functions. Because this is one of the biggest issues we don't normally tend to see. But these are some of the things that cause some of, most of the problems. Because when one party is in power, those in support of that party who are not who are not in the mainstream of administration may not want to do their jobs according to how they have to do it. On the other hand also, when a party is in power, those who are not in support of the, the party in power also do not do their jobs according to how they should do it. And the effects of these we see in the breakdown of infrastructure and a lot of other things. And in the end, it leads to a lot of um, problems resulting in economic, social, and other issues that may lead to disgruntlement, as we see happening now in our society again. A lot of gains were made after the war, but immediately there was a change in, in governance. We see a lot of changes happening that more or less are like taking us back. We need to ask why. Is it the politicians that are responsible? Is it because of increasing corruption? Or is it because we have a public administration that is non-challenged to the party in power? That was why I mentioned earlier that we need a national policy body that will incorporate all the political parties as well as the institutions that have been set up by the, the past government. We really need to be open and tolerant with ourselves, or else we are going back to war. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Jalo, what are your final thoughts on lessons learned? Yeah, well, basically I will zero in on three points. First is on the soft side something that uh, Dr. Wa has been pushing. We need to revisit the exercise of power in Sierra Leone in such a manner that it promotes inclusive political dialogue and enhanced state society relationship because that is where political stability lies. The second is on the hard side, like Jalo Jambore has said, improve state capacity. You know, like we were just talking about violence. Addressing violence in Sierra Leone will depend on the fortunes of the state. It will depend on the capacity of the state to deliver justice, effective policing, and security. We also need to address the inequitable distribution of resources. You know? But the final point I want to make is we need to move beyond looking at the country's challenges from a partisan and ethno-regional lenses. Sierra Leone is too small. This is the time, I think, given the kind of enormous challenges we are faced with, given our position, like Dr. Y has said, in the global economy, we are increasingly, the fortunes of countries and states like Sierra Leone are, are reducing dramatically. We need to forge a consensus around how to move the country from the state of weakness it finds itself today to a state where it can deliver good governance and development. And to do that, you really need to build that crop of Sierra Leoneans that will look at the country's challenges beyond simple partisan and ethno-regional lenses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Wai, your final thoughts? Um, I